Um, what I want to do is also present you an alternative uh, history of Nazi Germany. In other words, talk about the years between 1933 and 1945, not from your regular sort of perspective, but from the perspective of economics. And uh, really, one of the glaring things about economics is, uh, first, that the Nazis didn't care much about it, because they felt uh, if you just believe in a thing strong enough, then you can uh, bring the economics around. And the second aspect, the very sad aspect, is uh, the Nazis basically learned the lessons from World War I, where uh, German morale was eroded after 1916, because people were starving, so basically the Nazis took all the resources out of the countries that they occupied and basically relied on plunder to keep their own economics going. And the last thing I'm going to talk about labor, uh, the Nazis had no quarrels of uh, working people to death, as we know. We always talk about the death camps, but uh, one of the big uh, thing about the death camps is there was a selection done as people were arriving. Some were put uh, to death right away in the fake showers, others were selected to work. And those that were selected to work were basically selected to die also, but to die working. Okay, so all of these things are under the umbrella here of Nazi Germany's economic history. And there's a lot of controversy. I'm going to filter some of that out uh, because otherwise this will, of course, be another three-hour class. I'm just going to do this in an hour and 15 minutes, so bear with me. All right, Nazism and economy. And uh, this, is, this is a big thing uh, because that in the 70s and 80s there was a big discussion over whether the Nazis were really about securing the status quo or whether the Nazis did some sort of revolution, uh, some sort of social revolution. Um, the consensus now in the 1990s and moving into the 2000s is uh, the Nazis have a little bit of both. There is some sort of revolutionary aspect and it's interesting how much the Nazis actually borrowed from the Soviet Union. Uh, for better and for worse, uh, especially, you know, appropriation of certain socialist principles. Um, you know, minimum wage, uh, creating a day of labor, uh, having some sort of job security, and of course creating almost full employment by the year of 1936, especially after the devastating uh, Great Depression. But. Um, one of the most glaring aspects of the Nazis is, especially if you're looking at the leadership, Adolf Hitler, Goering, who would control the economy uh, before World War II, um, you notice that there's a lot of uh, disconnect. Uh, the Nazis believed in the economy of will, and uh, that's very much related to, to the sort of uh, movie that you saw, The Triumph of the Will, uh, namely the sort of notion that fascists have. If you believe in a thing strong enough, Right? If, and, and this is, again, an aspect of fascism. You're not supposed to use your mind. You're supposed to use your feelings, your emotion. You believe in something strong enough, it will become a reality. So in other words, if you, if you will, if you like, uh, the German economy into something, then that will become a reality. Uh, well, the reality is that uh, the economy has its own rhythms. And no matter how much willpower you put into it, uh, it really doesn't go the way you want it. And so there's a lot of disillusions that the Nazis would have early on. Part of that delusion would push them into really uh, building up a new economy, the economy of plunder. In other words, uh, exploit all the people that you conquer. So the other thing, um, again, uh, I mentioned this before, the lessons of World War I are crucial here. Uh, especially when we're looking at the year of 1916 and 1917, uh, the so-called turn-up years, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, basically, German morale was eroded during World War I, especially the popular morale by the people behind the front, and it ultimately led to uh, revolutions and the danger of becoming a communist socialist country. So this is something that the Nazis absolutely wanted to avoid. So, uh, in other words, their economy, even during the war, sometimes meant to appease people. So what we'll see, there's a very strange incident that after the defeat of France in the summer of 1940, by the way, if you wondered what my first picture is, this is a, very, this is a Frenchman 
witnessing the march of the German troops into Paris. Uh, you can see that he is not thrilled, to say the least. So, because he also knows what's coming. So, um, basically, basically uh, you use these economies for your own purpose. So you keep most of the economics in Germany intact, so the civilian population will continue to support you, even if they're suffering from uh, almost daily bombardments from the sky. Uh, you'd be surprised how um, favorable Hitler is. As a matter of fact, uh, Hitler's um, ranking among the Germans uh, after the defeat of France in the summer of 1940 was at something like 85%. Of course, these are you know figures that uh, current and past presidents only dream of, right? So um, because popularity indexes are not that high, but Hitler had done something, uh, defeated France, that uh, people believed would have been impossible. So all of these things are moving into, we're also going to talk about how the Nazis very skillfully appropriated socialist principles, but they had to be very careful in doing this because you don't want to ups upset the industrialists, you need them. You don't want to upset your own army, you need them as well. So you ha this has to be done very carefully. So they came up with a new principle. And uh, Dr. Vulcan already talked about this. Uh, the principle is Gleichschaltung, or make equal. Uh, should I write this down? Yeah, it's a German term. <laughs> Gleich means equal, and Schaltung means to switch, to make everybody equal, uh, and to create. Uh, what is known as the Volksgemeinschaft. Uh, and this translate, uh, loosely translate into a community of race. Yes, everybody was equal, but only if you are of pure and Aryan ancestry. Not if you're Jew, not if you're Cynthia Roma, uh, and not if you have certain beliefs that don't fit the image of the Nazis. <coughs> so, but again, the Volksgemeinschaft the dream is something that, of course, comes right out of Karl Marx. You know, a society supposedly that does not know class. The only problem is that you replace class with race, and you still have some people that are more equal than others, and other people that are, of course, excluded. So all of this, uh, as a sort of background, I mentioned already before the importance and the bitter lessons the Nazis learned from World War I, uh, between 1914 and 1918. Uh, what really what really uh, crippled the German economy uh, in World War I was a blockade. The Royal Navy blockaded most of the Baltic and the North Sea, uh, not allowing anything to reach Germany uh, during the conflict. What this meant is uh, that people, especially towards the later stages of the war, were literally starving um, because there was rationing, and uh, this rationing ultimately uh, resulted in the worst part, the so-called turnip winter. <coughs> I think I mentioned this already before. Uh, the turnip winter basically, uh, potatoes uh, the, weren't enough, so you replaced everything with turnip. Bread, coffee, uh, everything was made with turnips, and you can imagine that uh, if people are already cutting back on their diets and all of a sudden uh, what you hold dear, coffee, and uh, bread is also made out of turnips. Uh, you basically has, have a recipe of, for disaster. That ultimately happened towards the final stages of the war, uh, where the German sailors were asked to undertake a last major suicide mission against the Royal Navy, against the British Royal Navy. Uh, the sailors basically mutinied, uh, because they are too had seen the suffering of the German people, they said, this is a suicide mission, we will not do this. And this mutiny that started in the German city of Kiel, a northern German city, ultimately would spread throughout most of northern Germany, and it's partially responsible why the German government sued for the armistice now, on November 11th, 1918. So all of these, of course, are lessons. The Nazis know this, and they want to avoid this. You know, for the Nazis, of course, uh, this is a lesson that uh, they don't want to see. So, if the next conflict is coming, and yes, the Nazis foresaw that conflict was coming, you basically have to do a number of adjustments. First, 
There's a little ambiguity in the term national socialism because it combines two seemingly uh, opposed terms. Nationalism makes sense, pride in one's nation. And this is something the Germans definitely needed after the Treaty of Versailles, hyperinflation, the Great Depression. So in other words, make the Germans proud again. But then there's socialism. And socialism has a couple of people shaking in their boots. Does socialism mean that the Nazis are really communists under a different color? Do they want to recreate the Soviet Union of Germany? Do they want to bring about communism in Germany? So the Nazis, especially early on in doing their tenure, had to win the support of 80 industrialists. And if you're an industrialist, you're very concerned about that socialism. Because what if the Nazis come in and say, we're going to nationalize all businesses? So in other words, uh, yeah, you own, uh, let's say, a petrol business. We're going to nationalize that. We're going to take that away from you. Uh, you own an iron business. We're going to nationalize that. We're going to take that away from you. And the industrialists, and uh, there's always the rumor that the industrialists had supported the Nazis. Not a whole lot of them did. There were some, but the <coughs> nationalists were really worried about uh, uh, the, uh, the industrialists were worried about the Nazis. So. Hitler had to win these industrialists, and of course Hitler also had to win another very conservative force in German politics, the army. Yes, the army was reduced to 100,000 men, according to the Treaty of Versailles, so it was small, but it was a very professional army. Um, and the army was also the hotbed, if you like, of the aristocracy, uh, the last vintage, if you like, of the German aristocracy. So this is th these are two parties that you need to reach out to. Uh, you need to win them and you need to appease them. Um, and how do you do this? Well, the first thing that Hitler did uh, when he came to power, he appointed uh, not a Nazi to run the economy, but he actually appointed a conservative businessman by the name of Hammer Schacht, who stayed in that position until about 1936. And we'll talk about what happened after 1936. Uh, spoiler alert, nothing good. Um, especially if you're an economist, because that's when the Nazis, of course, uh, start to uh, rear off the plan. But Hammer Schacht uh, was really one of these confidants of, of a lot of industrialists who said, oh, look, the Nazis are not about nationalizing our business, taking our business away, but they're actually putting this conservative individual there. So maybe uh, they should be trusted. The other thing that Hitler very quickly did is uh, he actually said, do you remember war times? A lot of people were old enough that said, yes, we remember 1914 and 1918. And I said, weren't those good times for you guys? And the industrialists said, yes, because we kept strikes down, uh, you pay us really well. And Hitler said, well, why don't we create that wartime economy again? And we do this during peace time. And the industrialists said, fair enough, we will listen. Uh, what does that also mean? And this is why they also like Hitler. As we know very quickly, Hitler would curb all the leftist parties. Uh, the Reichstag fire basically led to the arrest and ultimately uh, outlawing of the Communist Party. The Socialist Party was not so far behind. So, uh, and then uh, in 1933, uh, when he had taken power, Hitler actually proclaimed that labor was something very good. And after he proclaimed that, he sent uh, basically the Gestapo into all labor union offices, made arrests, and smashed all the, all the files. Um, so he basically decided that labor unions are good, but I'll show you what he will do. He will actually, from all these different labor unions that are all focusing on different kind of industry, whether it's steel industry, whether it's coal industry, he decided to create one single labor union under the control of the Nazis. I'll get to this in a little. Lastly, um, this happened in the summer of 1934, uh, Hitler curbed his own socialist branch. Uh, there were some uh, leaders in the, uh, in the Nazi party, especially this guy, Hans Röhm, uh, who was the leader of the stormtroopers, the brown shirts, and uh, he actually said, that the Nazis need to do a second revolution. Not just take over political power in Germany, but also to nationalize businesses and to make sure that the German army 
needs to come under the control of the Nazis. This is something that Hitler tried to avoid. So consequently, he purged this individual. Uh, we'll talk more about this in a few weeks. He purged this individual during uh, a particular event that happened in the summer of 1934, known as the Night of the Long Knives, where he basically decapitated the leadership and ultimately had Armstrong killed. And there were a lot of other reasons why he wanted to get rid of him. But to curb the socialism within his own party, of course, appeased a lot of industrialists and uh, the German army. So he basically won them. And then, of course, uh, Hitler is very good in saying, we're going to rearm. And uh, all of the businesses said, yeah, that's good for us. You know, uh, you know about the military-industrial complex in this country. If you somehow are affiliated to any sort of uh, military industry, you're going to make lots and lots of profits. And that's really what you want to do. And uh, this is, of course, Adolf Hitler here, uh, you know, laying the groundwork for one of the perhaps best known accomplishments of the Nazis early on, the creation of the Autobahn, uh, the freeway system in Germany. Now, part of that was a work pro process. I mean, this is not uniquely German. Uh, the, uh, you, we're sitting here at California State Channel Islands. You know that this place used to be a mental hospital. And this was created because of the Great Depression. It was one of these projects uh, in the 1930s to get people back to work. So similar, th similar things, you have Adolf Hitler here. And of course, he didn't do a whole lot of digging. Uh, this was just a photo op. He just did it once. And then, you know, looks good on a cover. Uh, Die Straßen Adolf Hitlers, the streets of Adolf Hitler. Of course, the Autobahn was not just about putting people to work, but it's also about connecting Germany and especially connecting the military <coughs> within Germany so you can bring them up closer to the front very quickly. So infrastructure projects also have other purposes than putting people to work. Appropriating the left. Again, you don't want to appease the left because you don't really need the left. Uh, that's why you've gotten rid of the Communist Party. You've gotten rid of uh, the socialists. Um, but you still have people who have sentiments going towards the left, going towards socialism. Uh, so basically, Adolf Hitler had a few things to offer. And most of these things is, uh, of course, some people call the years between 1933 and 1936, especially my mother, uh, the good Nazi years. You know, I always cringe when I hear that. But I understand when you live through these years and you were unemployed before, and all of a sudden you have employment, then this might be a good thing. So creating employment through rearmament and autobahn is, of course, a major incentive uh, for individuals who are leaning left uh, to basically buy into the Nazi leadership. The other thing is, as I mentioned already before, the Volksgemeinschaft, uh, the sort of classless society that the Nazis promised, that everybody is equal. And if you're not equal, we'll make you equal, right? Uh, because that's why we have our camps for. Uh, because if you are the nail that sticks up higher, we're going we're gonna to hammer you down. So, of course, the Volksgemeinschaft wasn't just a classless society, but it also really had uh, that issue of race. So you had to have a certain racial component to be part of this. And the Nazis are one of the few regimes that define nationality purely on race. And that's an important thing to do, um, and a scary thing to do. So let me just, you know, show you a YouTube video about uh, some of these accomplishments that the Nazis do early on, Before and how they Hitler, won. Germany had been deep in economic depression. Before Hitler, unemployment had stood at seven million. Before Hitler, Germany was a democracy, but too many parties had split the vote so governments were weak and unable to solve the crisis. Hitler offered dictatorship, all power in the hands of one man. And Germany was quick to accept Hitler's terms. Unemployment's absurd. People say, we are civilized, and yet millions of people are out of work. What is that? That's sick. No one should be denied the right to work. And neither should anyone who can work be allowed to be lazy. 
work and bread. These are the Führer's blessings. Putting Germany back to work was Hitler's first and most pressing problem. But because he was all-powerful, he had the clout to carry out large-scale work programs, like building autobahns, motorways to link the nation together. By 1935, unemployment had fallen to just two million. By 1939, it was gone. My landlord, Eric, worked for the German labor front. He had business all around Germany, and once I went with him to see what they had achieved. And it was remarkable. We saw labor camps, not for wage earners, but for young people, 18, 19 years old, to teach them the value of work, to get their hands hardened. You saw them marching along with their spades like guns, or singing as they dug ditches, reclaimed land. If you spoke to them, sometimes you felt they resented being there, but not often. There was, I think, a pleasure involved. Eric would say, You must understand, work shouldn't be just earning a wage and going home. That's drudgery. We believe there's a beauty in labor. You do a job well, and it gives you happiness. It was like the Nazis were shaking people into feeling good about what they did. You had to work. You had no choice. You were organized. You were there for the state to use, and they would milk you for your labor, no question. But then, at the end of the day, they said, now, see what we have achieved. And it was. It was pretty impressive. The work program was vast and triumphal. Hitler had promised a Germany reborn. He said he was building for a state to last for a thousand years. He'd rebuild Berlin on a magnificent scale. There'd be an assembly hall in every city, a swimming bath in every village, a house and garden and car for every worker. Much of this was pure fantasy, but enough was achieved to pump German pride. A couple of things that uh, the Nazis are very good at. You know, much of this is propaganda, and you saw these people to work. Also, um, I don't know if you read the newspaper this morning, because there's, and I'm not going to mention names, because I don't want to get political, but there is currently a discussion between um, a House of Representatives and one of the most senior officers in the Trump administration about work, about labor. One, one basically advocates the creation of a, some sort of minimum wage and even a wage if you don't work uh, to get the economy started. And the other one says that people uh, sh shouldn't do this because people take pride in work, that work somehow creates uh, new human beings. And it's interesting how these discussions that the Nazis were holding in the 1930s are still discussions that we, we, we hear today. And I'm going to leave it at this. But uh, there's much discussion right now in Europe, for instance, about creating a, a livable wage, uh, making sure that uh, when you work, you actually have enough that you can have a house, that you can have a family. And uh, this is a big discussion. And of course, the Nazis said, this is what we're going to do. And um, they had a lot of projects. You know, for instance, the Volksgemeinschaft, which Volk means people, okay? all of the people, also required that the Nazis basically start investing into making everybody equal. We see folk, the term folk, in a number of things that you've heard before. The Volksempfänger, what's that, Dr. Walken? That is the, uh, was that my the car? No, uh, that's folks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's the radio. You know, when you're the Volksempfänger, it's basically the radio. But you make it affordable to for everybody can get it. If you're of low income, the Nazis would give you a grant that you could purchase this radio. 
What's the, what's the, uh, what is the purpose behind this? Not to put a radio in everybody's house. Yes, that's nice, but also so everybody can receive the propaganda <coughs> messages that the Nazis are putting out there. The Volkswagen, right? Uh, a particular car that the Nazis envisioned. Problem is the war came too soon, so um, the Volkswagen really didn't hit the shelf until after the war. And uh, that is, the, you know, of course, the Beetle, uh, the very famous one. Uh, the Nazis also proclaimed to have low-income housing, Wohnungen, which means housing, to basically create, uh, you know, living spaces for everybody. Uh, the reality is that the Nazis never put a whole lot of uh, emphasis on this. And as soon as the war broke out, that program, of course, was interrupted. Um, but they were there. You know, the ideas were there. And the ideas, of course, were to capture those people who had left as leanings. Uh, who had actually seen as the Nazis, not as just these tyrannical individuals, but also individuals who cared for the greater good of uh, German society. One of my most favorite posters that the Nazis, and I have a lot, uh, the Nazis were very good at propaganda, as uh, Dr. Volkan told you, is this one. Uh, if there's ever a poster that kind of shows wartime economy in peace times, is this one. This is a poster of the Deutsche Arbeiterfront, which is the German Workers' un uh, Union. <coughs> Basically, all labor unions in Germany were merged into one. Okay, so um, labor unions, well, we have a labor union here at the university, right? Labor unions are generally just speak for a particular slice of people. Uh, our union is the uh, faculty union, right? California faculty. California Faculty Union that really just speaks for university professors or people who teach at universities. So the Nazi says, no, 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 no union just for professors, but one union for all. And they call it, I mean, you know, just, just the title is wonderful, German Workers Front, right? It's just about something, the front is, of course, in war, but you're not at war, at least not in 1934. And, uh, you basically show, this poster shows this. We are bleiben Kameraden. And Kameraden, comrade, is basically a term that the Soviet Union used, right? Uh, but you, what you see here is a common worker with a hammer and his friend, who is probably designer, call him white collar uh, employee. And it says, damals wie heute, back then as today, we will remain comrades. And you have the shadow of World War I continuing into the Nazi economy. Now, this poster, is, you know, if, if you ever want to talk about the sort of fascism ideal of recreating war society during peacetime, this is it. Okay. Now, the problem about uh, the uh, German workers' front, of course, the industrialists were worried. It's like, oh, you're creating a labor union here. And uh, the Nazis very quickly told the industrialists, yes, we do. But the labor union basically will do a couple things. It will A, freeze prices for the workers, B, prevent strikes and uh, other work slowdown from happening. So this particular German, German workers front wasn't really speaking for the workers. It was really a long arm of the industrialists. Okay? And that should be kept in mind, despite all the propaganda that's going on here. The other thing that the Nazis were very good at is uh, Kraft durch Freude, means strength through joy. Anybody knows what that means? Because it's, uh, it's again another government pro uh, program that was very uh, successful in, reading, in reaching the hearts and the minds of the German workers. These are basically subsidized vacations, okay? Strength through joy. Give the workers joy and therefore strength will come. So what the, what the German industry started doing is investing in building huge cruise ships that would basically take the German workers to the fjords of Norway, uh, to some of the islands in the Atlantic. Um, and since most workers wouldn't have the money to pay for this, they would be subsidized. So in other words, let's say a trip to, I don't know, uh, the Azores would cost you a thousand Reichsmark. You don't have that money. Uh, the Nazis would make sure that that trip would cost you only a third of that, 300 price mark. Again, subsidized travel. Why? To gain the support of those people who are left leanings. Because they're saying, hey, how about that? 
By 1939, we have full employment. Uh, we have these subsidized trips. The Nazis are really uh, you know, bringing in some socialist methods, creating houses, uh, and we still have labor unions. <coughs> you know, because the radical labor union leaders, of course, are no longer there to contest that because they are in concentration camps, uh, much like the communist leaders, too. Yep. All of this is good. I mean, the Nazis are said during the so-called good years, and I want you to be careful in using that term, good years, in quotation marks, because good years also implies that a large segment of the German population is discriminated against, especially if you're Jewish. Uh, a very large section of German population is forced to emigrate uh, because of political differences. And uh, then there's a, another section of the German population that immediately after 1933 sits in concentration camps. They're basically re-educated into thinking. So, but then uh, the German economy starts to stutter. Uh, you know, it, start, it starts to slow down. Um, the Nazis are not happy about this. Again, you know, for the Nazis, the economy, that's just noise. You know, don't, don't come with economic theory if we will something, then it will happen. And Halmar Schacht says, that's not how the economy works. You've got to do something about this. You've got to listen to me. And Hitler doesn't like to be talked down to, so he lets Halmar Schacht go. And he replaces him with a very loyal Nazi by the name of Hermann Goering. You probably know about that guy. Big guy. And Hermann Goering basically says, yes, yeah, sure, we're going to make the economy work. So we're basically going to introduce, after 1936, the so-called four-year plan, a four-year plan to run between 1936 to 1940. It is interesting that the Nazis are not very innovative here, uh, because the sort of planned economy is something that Joseph Stalin had done successfully in the Soviet Union since the 1920s. <coughs> the main difference between the Nazi plan and the Stalin plan was that Stalin called it a five-year plan, and the Nazis would call it a four-year plan. So obviously it's not the same thing, right? It's just uh, you're basically sticking a lot of things in a very narrow, narrow time frame, and you're hoping that this will go well. Uh, let me just say that Joseph Stalin, what he did, uh, he did horrible things in the 1920s. In order to, I mean, the five-year plans of Joseph Stalin, and there were a number of them, basically meant to industrialize the Soviet Union. And that was successful industrial output in the Soviet Union between the 1920s and 1930s rose by about a thousand percent. That's a lot. However, that came at a price. The price was human lives. Because what Stalin also did is he collectivized um, farms, he forced people into these collectives, and when they rebelled, they were shot. Uh, some of them starved to death. In other words, Stalin's plan cost millions and millions of lives. Hitler, on the other hand, uh, also wanted a, a four-year plan, but Germany was already industrialized, so you didn't have to industrialize Germany. You wanted to do something else, and this is what the dream of the Nazis was, economic self-sufficiency. So now, otherwise, do not, I mean, this is something that we still hear in the rhetoric today, right? Try not to be dependent on other countries. That's why you drill, 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 baby, and drill some more, right? Sounds very familiar. So. But the Nazis did this too, economic self-sufficiency. We sometimes call this autarky. Okay, that's the term, autarky. So basically, make sure that you produce everything you need, because then you don't need other nations. Then you're not, you don't have to have tariffs. Uh, you don't have to have import, export tariffs. You can produce everything in your own country. So what you focus in the four-year plan then was to create artificial raw materials. Germany uh, has some resources. The most plentiful resource that Germany has is coal. So you use that coal to basically create a resource that Germany does not have, petrol, oil. Because all of the German oil, um, this was before they started drilling in the North Sea, uh, all of the German oil is basically imported from outside, Southeast Asia, uh, from Russia, the Soviet Union. We're going to talk more about that, uh, which kind of seemed ironic. Wait, Stalin? Is helping out Hitler? Yes, he is. Uh, weird stuff. Weird stuff going on. So, but basically, uh, again, it's the economy of will. 
You know, we want autarky. We believe in autarky, <coughs> so it's going to happen. Mm. Not so easy. Huh? Not so easy. The other thing uh, artificial raw material trying to do is create uh, rubber. Most of rubber, the tires that you need for, uh, for pretty much everything, whether it's an aircraft, whether it's a truck, uh, whether it's just a common car, most of that rubber comes in from rubber plantations that grow in tropical areas. But you don't have, unless you have a, a greenhouse, you can't really have rubber trees. So the Germans decided to introduce a substitute called Buna. Um, it is really interesting to know that in Auschwitz, the very famous death camps that the Nazis were operating, they also had a labor camp known as Birkenau that was next to Auschwitz. That one was producing Buna. And you can see already how this comes directly out of the four-year plant. The other thing, of course, and this again was copied from uh, Stalin, you had to organize food supply. Because right? here's the kicker. Uh, Germany has uh, close, over 60 million people. They need to be fed. And uh, the reality is that before the Nazis took power, uh, only about 60% of all the food in Germany was produced in Germany. The rest was imported. Grain, rice, uh, livestock. Um, so um, the Germans, the Nazis, I should say, basically try to do, uh, come up with some sort of autarchy by organizing all of the agriculture in Germany into the Reich and Food Estate. Uh, again, this was an idea, idea taken from Stalin, but uh, the Nazis were reluctant to collectivize. In other words, do not take the land away from the private owners. Uh, but you, but you basically do is you do not collectivize. You keep, you keep every everybody gets to keep their own land. Everybody gets to keep their own farm. But we're going to dictate the kind of food you grow, the the quantities of food you grow, and most importantly. We're going to dictate prices. How much can you charge for the food that you grow? Again, uh, not so far from collecting. It's controlling everything. You can imagine that some peasants weren't too happy about this. Because, you know, if you, if you go to the farmer's market, you want to sell certain things for a certain price. Because, uh, let's say, you have organic produce. You want to charge more because it costs more, uh, right? But the rice and food estate will tell you, no. If you sell a lemon, it cannot be more than 10 cents, period. It will be interesting to see the Ojai farmer's market. <laughs> the reality. The reality is, uh, you know, that the Nazis had this illusion. And Hermann Goering, well, how should we classify Hermann Goering? He wasn't very good at what he was doing. So, you know, there's a lot of will, uh, but not a lot of economics. Uh, in other words, there was a major disconnect. And uh, the reality was that Germany still had to import most raw materials. And uh, that, fought the Nazi, that, that basically pushed the Nazis in a very uncomfortable uh, <coughs> pact with the Soviet Union. And you may ask yourself, why does Stalin and Hitler come together? Uh, and here's why. Stalin had supported the Republic during the Spanish Civil War. His attempt was not to keep the Republic going and to prevent the, the spread of fascism, but Stalin really wanted to open up to the West. He tried to lure the French and, and the British to join him into the campaign. Uh, they didn't, so Stalin became more and more disillusioned uh, with the Western democracies. Finally, he realized that uh, the only person that really had some oomph and some backbone was Adolf Hitler. So in August of 1939, notice that that's a month before the German invasion of Poland, uh, a really strange arrangement occurs where the Soviet Union signed an agreement with Hitler. A big part of this agreement was basically the partition of Poland. The Germans were going to get uh, most of the western part of Poland, while the Soviet Union was to get the eastern part. And that was one thing, the sort of... Mm, non-official part of the pact that wasn't really released to the press. But uh, the other pact was that the Soviet Union had all of this stuff that Germany needed, food stuff, grains, uh, you know, from the Ukraine, for instance. So, 
but they also had oil, petrol. And this is something, of course, that the Nazis needed. So this is a, this is a great graphic you know, that shows you imports from the USSR as a percentage of the total German overseas imports between February of 1940 and June of 1941. What happened after June of 1941? <coughs> Operation Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa, uh, the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. Right? That's, of course, when all the impacts go. Right? It's kind of interesting. Um, but check this out. That is 80% right here. 80%. In late 1940, imports of the Soviet Union exceed 80% of all foreign imports. Of course, it needs to be considered that Germany is at war during this time, so they can no longer get imports from France, from Belgium. Well, Belgium they can because they occupy it, and France, same thing. But uh, there is a major cutoff, so the percentage of imports really go up from the Soviet Union. So what happens on June 22, 1941, and we'll talk more about this next week, the Germans invade the Soviet Union. And with this, they basically bite the hand that feeds you. It was a crazy gamble. Uh, the notion was that the German soldier was undefeated in so many campaigns. They would defeat the Soviet Union, and then you don't have to negotiate with the Soviets. You can just take. Uh, turns out that they were wrong in so many things. So what we see very quickly then with the four-year plan kind of uh, stuttering and Goering not doing so well is we have a major shift to another economy happening in uh, Nazi Germany. And more and more historians are turning to that now. And that is the economy of plunder. Uh, we know this best, of course, of, because of all the artwork that the Nazis took out of the places that they invaded. But here are some of the quotes. Others would starve before Germany suffers. Adolf Hitler. Hans Frank, who's the governor general of Poland, wrote this in 1944, I mean towards the end of the war. Once we have won the war, then for all I care, mincemen can be made of the Polish and the Ukrainian and all others who have been run around here. Eric Koch, who was the right commissar of the Ukraine. Our task is to suck out of the Ukraine all goods we can get a hold of without consideration of the feeling or property of the Ukrainians. Gentlemen, I am expecting from you the utmost severity towards the native population. In other words, suck them dry. Suck them dry so Germany will not suffer. This is all for the end, a very different uh, shift. This sort of shift um, also allowed to reach out feelers uh, to a number of um, American companies, and this is a very controversial thing, because uh, if you go on the internet, there's a lot to be made about uh, American companies supported the Nazis, and uh, Professor uh, Bill Cordero spent a lot of time on this, so I'm just going to basically talk about it as an aside. Um, but there is, um, among American businesses, to some extent, uh, at, least, at least an empathy, if not a sympathy, for the Nazis. And the best example of this is none other than Henry Ford. Um, Henry Ford is best known to you as uh, the Model T producer, uh, who basically brought the assembly line. Um, and Henry Ford has a lot, he's a human being, so there's not all good in Henry Ford. Uh, to be exact, Henry Ford was tremendously anti-Semitic. And here's the interesting thing. Uh, there's been some studies now that basically say that Henry Ford's anti-Semitism stems from before the Nazis. He's mostly influenced by uh, the Protocol of the Elders of Zion and literature that comes out of Russia. Um, but there's a connection here because this literature, of course, will also influence the Nazis. Uh, much like the Nazis, Henry Ford does not like labor unions. He prevents them. Uh, but uh, he also uses not just violence against the labor unions, he also tries to win the workers over. He's the first one to introduce the five-day working week that we have today, Monday through Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. And he introduces for the first time the $5 a day wage because this is known as welfare capitalism. Because you realize that Karl Marx is not entirely wrong 
if you don't pay your workers an appropriate salary, they cannot buy what you produce. And basically creating a crisis of capitalism. You want to avoid that. So by basically investing in your workers, you will ensure that you always have a market for your own products. Uh, not so different from what the Nazis were trying to do. Henry Ford uh, wrote uh, a book in the 1920s, uh, a very controversial one, uh, a book basically <coughs> entitled The International Jew. Uh, he has the same thing as Nazis, the argument that Jews are trying, are concerned about some sort of conspiracy to take over the entire world. Um, because there was sympathy between Henry Ford and the Nazis, he of course started investing in Germany and building up uh, what is known as the Ford Werke in Germany that uh, really kept producing until the end of the war. Uh, so even once the United States was at war with Germany, Ford still kept producing. Uh, this could be done because Ford Werke moved to Switzerland to a neutral country so the business was not done between the United States and Nazi Germany. Because Ford uh, invested into Nazi Germany and because the Nazis saw in Ford uh, an individual uh, that had similar leanings as them, the anti-Semitism in particular, he was given the Grand Cross of the German Eagle. And this is, here you see the German ambassador giving this particular decoration to Henry Ford in 1938. He was pressured to return that decoration. He did not. Um, Henry Ford, of course, would die in 1946. So uh, there was never much against him uh, doing the war. Perhaps the better known business um, and the Nazis, IBM, International Business Machine. Uh, a business created by Hermann Hollerith, Hermann Hollerith, at the turn of the century. Uh, and basically, what IBM is very good at is <coughs> counting, creating statistics, by introducing what is known as the Hollerith machines. And uh, you probably know this from, well, maybe you don't know this no more. Do you still, do you still use Scantrons? Who has used Scantrons? I mean, okay, so yeah, that comes from that, you know where basically you have uh, machines that read punching cards. And uh, these punching cards are very good in counting people. They're used in censuses. Uh, for instance, why did the United States government know where all the Asian Americans were, especially Japanese Americans, in 1942? These kind of cards. Thomas Watson would take over the company after 1914 and it was Thomas Watson who would expand IBM into Germany very successfully. Once uh, the Nazis took power, uh, they wrote extensively to Thomas Watson, and there was including this, this particular this quote that always makes me cringe. The government of the Führer, Adolf Hitler, is statistically friendly. Hmm. It's your friendly fascism, not so friendly. Because why are you statistically friendly? Because you like counting. So when you have uh, some sort of census, you can count somebody as Aryan. Or you can punch somebody in as Jew. And uh, you come up with all kinds of uh, designation of how you classify a person. Have you ever seen this particular tattoo? Many of you have not. We still have. Um, this is an Auschwitz tattoo. This was tattooed on the people as they were moving in to the death camps. It is the direct result of the Hollerith cards because this code would indicate whether you were an ethnic minority, political prisoner, sexual deviant, uh, you know, Jehovah's Witness, all of this stuff, this is something that the statistically friendly government of the Nazis would exploit. It is estimated that uh, before the United States joined into the conflict, IBM was exporting over one billion of these cards to the Nazis. One billion every year. Used to count people in death camps. Used to count people 
Every time the Nazis invaded another country, the first thing that was done was counted, classified. Scary thought. Right. Yes. You mentioned too when they invaded, I think it was Belgium, there was a huge census of the cows. It wasn't just people. There was a huge census of the cows and they recorded them on these holiday numbers. And, and why is that? So they know where the cows were, so they can know where to take them. Economy of plunder. You know, you count every single cow in Belgium <coughs> using these cards. So when the Germans need those kind of livestock, they know where to find them. Statistically friendly. It's not just human being, but it's also livestock. All in terms of gaining autarky. By why gaining autarky? By plundering other nations. By first statistically see them, classify them, and then extract their resources. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Thomas Watson was also given a decoration in 1937 for all of his efforts that he made to, un to un uh, uh, support the Nazi statistics. The, the Order of the German Eagle in 1937. Of course, there's a lot of pressure on Watson. And uh, unlike Ford, Watson would ultimately return it in 1940 uh, by basically saying that he could not support uh, the sort of politics of the Nazi regime. And that was uh, smart. But the Nazis nevertheless still acquired IBM cards even throughout the war. Because what IBM did, much like Ford company, is set up business in Switzerland. And many of you, the question is always asked once during this class, why didn't the Nazis invade Switzerland? And uh, Switzerland is a banking center. You need Switzerland to do your legal and not so legal. Uh, because the, the Nazis are also uh, basically laundering the gold from the Jews through Switzerland. So occupying Switzerland, yeah, you can crush them, even if it will be difficult because Switzerland is easily defendable. But when you crush Switzerland, you don't have this international business center that really you can use for your own purposes. And you should also mention too, to turn the subject of why they didn't, why they didn't take over Sweden. Oh, right. That's the other one. And that's the Sweden produced very high quality steel, and so steel as you keep supplying with the steel will leave you alone. But if they didn't, they right. probably would have been invaded. Just like if Switzerland refused to do business with the Nazis, they probably would have been invaded. All part of this autarky again. You know, Sweden is more important to be neutral because Sweden guarantees you a certain type of iron ore, excellent iron ore. Um, the similar agreement the Nazis also had with Spain, because Spain is a major supply of tin. So one of the things that uh, um, Francisco Franco would do after he had won the Spanish Civil War is uh, give Germany a steady supply of tin. Again, there was talk about, uh, you know, at one point Franco and Hitler tried to create a united front to conquer uh, Gibraltar, but that never came about. So the best thing to appease the Nazis was to give them some, some strategical medal that they could not otherwise get. Plunder starts at home. Uh, you know, many of you know, uh, you know about the Holocaust, the final uh, solution, as the Nazis would call it. But before the Nazis would take Jewish lives, uh, they would take their wealth. Uh, it started by basically calling for boycotts against Jewish businesses immediately after the Nazis took power in January of 1933. Uh, but then the Nazis made some very strange agreements. I don't know how many of you have heard about the Havara Agreement. Basically an agreement with uh, Jewish individuals living in Palestine to allow 60,000 German Jews to leave Germany and uh, to settle in Palestine. So seemingly that's a good thing, right? Uh, yeah, but in return, uh, these Jews had to pay, had to give the Nazis, had to sign over much of their property. Uh, in other words, yes, maybe you could get to Palestine, but you would be penniless with very limited resources to your name. In 1935, and we'll talk more about this in detail, the Nuremberg Laws were passed, basically stripping Jews of uh, their civil rights. Jews could no longer officially serve in the German army. Jews could no longer marry Aryan individuals. If you had a mixed marriage between an Aryan and a Jew, 
Uh, divorce proceedings were really easy for you. You just had to say, I don't want to be married to this person no more. And there you go. Um, the Nuremberg Law is also very good in classifying the Holocaust thing. You know, what is a Jew? Is a half Jew a Jew? And we'll hear more about this in the movie Conspiracy. Um, and then, by 1938, again, this was immediately before there was active violence against Jewish individuals, the decree of reporting Jewish own property. In other words, all Jewish individuals had to report any property valued more than 5,000 Reichsmark uh, to the Nazis. So the Nazis, again, statistically <coughs> friendly, start to compile what you all have. So if we want to, if we start arresting you, we can come after that and we can use it. The most important aim, I'm sorry I'm taking too long here, so I'm going to turn on the afterburners here, is again preserving the morale of the German people, uh, preserving the home front. And I'll talk more about this next week. Uh, the home front is very important. There's no fighting really on the home front in 1939 and 1940, but there's morale issues. You won't want people to slow down the work process. You need them. So basically you engage in um, shallow production. Shallow production because it's not, uh, you don't really focus on these great aims like creating housing for everybody. Ah, that's, that's, you know, deep production. And you don't really, you promise that there's this thing called social security, but we'll wait until the end of the war, right? Uh, we'll, we'll get to that, but not, not just now. But what we do is we basically trick the people into that the war is not so bad, so we're going to focus on luxury goods, on clothing that you can buy in shops. Right? Even during the war, you can steal this. And the most important thing that the Nazis wanted to avoid is rationing, because rationing is bad. If you don't get meat, if you don't get butter, if you don't get your booze, or even your cigarettes, that's going to impact morale. So let's not do that. And of course, plundering again. If anybody has to suffer, so Germany doesn't, it's going to be the occupied territories. And of course, if you know anything from the war between 1939 and 1941, Germany not only doubles in size, but it gets much, much bigger. And they're going to use all of these territories to keep German production the way it was. Um, even when you're in occupied territories, there are lucky ones and not so lucky ones. If you have a choice, the last place you want to be is the bloodlands in the east. Ukraine, Belarus, Poland. Uh, no. Uh, but in the West, you had to suffer, right? Um, but uh, initially, the Nazis <coughs> were relatively good to the occupied countries. I, I'm saying relatively. Of course, there will be no elections. Um, there's a great movie I just watched. It's called uh, The King's Choice. It's a Norwegian movie. It's about uh, the role of the Norwegian king. Uh, that basically shows how the Nazis basically just appoint a leader for the Norwegians. Uh, his name is Quisling, which after the war also became a synonym of traitor. Um, so, so the Nazis appoint your leaders. You don't really have much of a say. Uh, so what you find in the West, there's a little bit of people are torn between should we collaborate with the Nazis or should we resist them? And actually, we'll talk more about this. We'll find out that actually, um, until late of the war, more people in the West collaborated than resisted the Nazis. Initially, the Nazis basically promised, the Nazis promised that uh, out of the Nazi conquest would come a stronger union, a European union. Mm, you know, again, um, take this with a grain of salt because there are some uh, individuals who claim that the Nazis had invented the European Union. I uh, know. Because the European Union is really about being equals, not about one country extracting all of the resources. Because what the Nazis really were doing during the brief honeymoon period between 1940 and 1941 is building up a scaffold for exploitation. So Germany first, the other ones very, very distant second. 
I'm going to skip this, not that important. Uh, as I mentioned, if you're in the West, this was bad. Things were bad. And there was a repression, there was arrests. If you were a Jewish individual, a communist, you certainly had to uh, suffer tremendously in the occupied territories in the West. But if you're in the East, things are so much worse. Because, and we'll talk more about this next week, the Nazis believed you are not human. You are Slav, and consequently, you are there for only one purpose, and that is to serve the area. And if you don't serve, you're going to die. This is part of Hitler's, uh, and we're going to talk more about this next week, philosophy of Lebensraum, uh, basically creating a living space in the East. This living space is not for the people living there, but it's actually a living space for Germans to expand, because Germany is such a crowded country that they need to move east and take over the agricultural resources of these people. Um, the Nazis knew uh, that the countries like uh, the Ukraine, Belarus, uh, really what made up the Soviet Union, had boundless resources, food stuff, but also, most importantly, the most strategic resource, and the Germans were really after this, was oil. Because if you have no oil, you cannot fly planes, you cannot run tanks, you cannot get supplies. Germany has coal, and they have come up with a way of making coal into, into petrol, but that's expensive, so you really want to get the real thing if you can. So even before the Germans uh, started invading the Soviet Union, they came up with plans. And again, unfortunately, this plan was inspired by Stalin. Because what Stalin did throughout the 1920s and 1930s is he used starvation to force people into submission. So the Germans developed in the spring of 1941, before the invasion of the Soviet Union, a hunger plan. Because the notion was, and I'll show you more, I'll show you a little bit more details when we talk about the Eastern Front, to basically starve millions and millions of people. So you create space, living space, for Germans. And if you don't have enough Germans, you take those people who are almost like Germans. The Dutch, the Flemish, the Norwegians, the Danish. They're really like Germans, right? You can get them there, we Germanize them. And uh, um, this would get even more worse, and I'm going to talk more about this next week, I promise, in the Generalplan Ost, which was devised by Heinrich Himmler, the SS, uh, which basically talked about getting rid of two-thirds of the people under German control. When I say get rid of, exterminate, kill. So basically what the Germans are doing here is not just plunder, but what becomes part of this is genocide. It becomes part of your economic picture by 1942. Germany needs laborers. Germany is at war. Uh, after 1941, it's a life or death war. Uh, it's a production war. Because you're facing the Soviet Union, uh, a production giant on one hand, and this is another crazy thing. Hitler declares war in the United States in December of 1941. Uh, Mussolini's son in law, Ciano, who was also his foreign, uh, foreign minister, came in when Mussolini started to declare war in the United States. He basically brought in a phone book of uh, New York City and he slams it on the desk of Mussolini. He says, do you want to go to war with these people? <laughs> and yeah, but it's, again, it's a sort of fascist thing. No matter, you will, right? Will. Will is more important than all these economic realities that you could show us. But nevertheless, even the Nazis say that you have these two giants that, you, that you're facing. You need to start recruiting. <coughs> you need to get labor. Also, because your best and brightest are now serving on the Eastern Front. They're going there after Operation Barbarossa. So you have to make sure that you fill in the dwindling numbers of, of laborers. With what? Where do you take them from? The occupied territories. And this friendly guy here, Notice the little beard. You know, that was sort of like uh, the stylish look that he had. I'm not sure he actually did fight. I don't know much about his background. He may have fought in World War I. Probably had the age to, but it's also like a, uh, just a thing to connect yourself to Adolf Hitler. 
Uh, this guy's name is Zalpa. And he was basically put in charge to uh, recruit foreign laborers into Germany. And when I say recruit, uh, it has this sort of, uh, it seems to suggest that it's voluntary. A lot of this is known as forced labor, bringing them in, especially from the East. And uh, we'll show you some of the numbers and the importance of foreign laborers for the German economy. By 1941, you had about 4 million foreign workers. Of these, 50% were Polish. Uh, again, 1941, you still had not invaded the Soviet Union, so all of this would, of course, change. By 1944, towards the end of the war, that number almost doubled. 7.6 million foreign workers, and they were referred to as Ost. That's basically what you have in front of your uniform. Ost means East. That is Polish. Ukrainian, Belarusian, uh, Russian, you know, Ost. Ost. They made up about 20% uh, of the German workforce. So one out of five workers working in German factories is a foreigner. And uh, there is a similar number of forced laborers that are basically working for you in the occupied territories, in Belgium, in France, in Norway. Estimates exceed about 12 million foreign workers in Germany during this particular campaign. Um, why do industrialists do this? About 2,000 German companies were the main beneficiaries from slave labor. And we'll get to this because is there something being done about this? Yes, but it's too little, too late. In the West, you had uh, some sort of recruitment effort. And it was a little bit more voluntary, especially early on. Um, but uh, that too would change. Here you see a couple of French posters. Um, they donate their blood. <coughs> Please donate your labor. <coughs> so in other words, there were German soldiers fighting go into the factories and donate your labor. Population abandonnée. Uh, these are basically the abandoned population. Faith confiance au soldat allemand. Have confidence in the German soldier. So these are basically displaced people saying, the German soldier is good to you. Isn't that beautiful poster? All of these kids looking up to the German soldier. It's like, yes, we'll take care of you. Mm -hmm. How about working for us, right? Uh, I mean, these children will grow up eventually perfect workers. Much of this was, of course, organized with uh, collaborative re regimes. The best known is, of course, Vichy France. Um, but uh, many of these countries already after 1942 would feel the brunt of the Nazi labor recruitment. Um, and you would also feel the brunt of not getting enough to eat if you're French and you're born uh, between the 1930s and 1940s, you remember one term, ersatz, even if you don't speak German. Ersatz means substitute, because everything is substituted out. You don't get the real thing. Butter? No, margarine. It's supposed to be healthier. But, you know, if you like the taste of butter, you're not going to get a margarine. Recruiting in the East. Uh, you know, if the West was bad, oh, I should also talk about the service du travail obligatoire. Towards the end of the war, Vichy France actually did not just recruit laborers, but also forced people into working for Germany. Uh, service du travail obligatoire, yeah, that basically means obligatory service. So in other words, voluntary is gone. And even in the West, forced labor became the norm. Um, beautiful posters, advertising what working for the Germans would be like. This uh, unnamed woman from the East basically works with the children making the food, the mother looking over their shoulder, all happy, right? Uh, the realities were very different. Here we actually have a passport. Uh, people were forced into labor. Only very few uh, worked in households. Most of them worked in cramped condition. 
unhygienic conditions in German factories. Last category, we have the Western East. Um, there's working people to death. I'm not saying that many of the Eastern workers weren't worked to death, uh, but remember what happens to the Jews, especially after 1942, when they go into the death camps. Jews become a special category of, of forced labor, according to the Nazis. Special categories because they get no protection. You work until you literally drop dead. So labor becomes extermination. What you have is, and this is very interesting, um, in the death camps, especially Auschwitz, you have regular phone contact between fighter production in Germany, who basically says, stop, stop the showers, stop the gas chambers. We need a thousand more people right now. So the selection that usually ends up in death as soon as you arrive in Auschwitz might be more alive because they need the numbers. And this is something that the movie Conspiracy also does very well, uh, because there is the, you know, there's much discussion, especially by the person who's in charge of the four-year plan, which, you know, calling the four-year plan still four-year plan in 1942 is kind of ironic. That's why nobody takes him seriously. But, you know, he constantly says, we're not meeting our production goals. If you go ahead and kill Jewish individuals that we need for the production of German tanks, of German aircraft, of German fighters, that is not good. But of course, he's overruled. Uh, but we do have the selection that stems from this. Um, we don't often uh, reason why the Nazis would actually make a selection. Why don't they kill everybody right away? It's because of this. They select those who are able to work. Um, I talked about this already before. The most famous extermination camp is Auschwitz. You probably heard about the name. Connected to Auschwitz is a labor camp that was making artificial rubber, Luna, known as Birkenau. So the notion here is basically um, labor until death. Very different from the Ost or the West uh, laborers. These people will work to death. Towards the end of the war, as we move into 1944 and 1945, bless you, uh, Jewish laborers were basically producing the German vengen, uh, vengeance weapons, sorry, Vergeltungswaffen in German. You know what those are, right? The V1 and the V2. We'll talk more about it. Uh, keep in mind, these are basically your first rockets that they would send over to London. Uh, vengeance because it's revenge against the bombers that the English and the Americans are sending over. And in, most of these were produced in um, salt mines and abandoned German salt mines um, with concentration camps that had Jewish individuals and other undesirables. Uh, these people had no toilets, had no sleeping quarters, got food only occasionally, and uh, it is interesting to see the reality that the Nazis are putting out. He had the Nazis basically building a V2 rocket, and you see the concentration camp individual who's helping them, the scientists, the reality is like this. Regular beatings. This is basically a drawing from somebody made one of the most notorious camps was known as Dora. Uh, this is a drawing from Dora where people literally were work to death. No regard. Um, what happened to many of these individuals who forcefully worked for the Germans? Uh, and it pains me to say so, up until recently, a whole lot of nothing. Uh, and there's reason for this. Um, while Jewish individuals got compensation, not enough, not adequate, if you were a forced laborer in Germany, you got nothing. Well, at least until the year 2000. So only about 19 years ago. And the reason why, why this happened is basically because the Western Allies were concerned about crippling Germany's economy by forcing Germany to pay 
uh, reparation to all these laborers that have forcefully worked in Germany. There was also the notion, well, most of these laborers came from the East, so they went back, so it should be the responsibility of the Soviet Union to reimburse these laborers. And as you can imagine, the Soviet Union said, why should we reimburse these laborers that the Germans used to produ produce weapons against us? So, um, it wasn't until the year 2000 that a number of uh, German companies got together to create a fund. Uh, it is known as the German Forced Labor Compensation Fund, created in the year 2000. A um, couple of problems happened. First, it's the year 2000. So if it's estimated that about 12 million uh, workers worked for the Germans, forced laborers, in the year 2000, that number had dwindled to about 1.7 million. Because people got old, old age. And people were already at old age when they were working for the Germans when they were 30s or their 40s. So by the year 2000, they were no longer alive. Or some of them, of course, died, had also shorter life because of all the hardships that they had suffered in Germany. So several of the companies that profited from forced labor got together and created a fund. This was a voluntary fund. The German government also put in, and they came up with 4.3 billion euros. That's the equivalent, roughly, of 5 billion US dollars. Uh, each one of these survivors, depending on the severity, got between 2,500 and 7,500 euros, a one-time payment. Uh, in U.S. dollars, that's about $3,000 to $8,500, a one-time payment. 